It's so good to see you, and happy Mother's Day. We're here to worship the Lord, of course, and we've been doing that, but I want to say just a quick word to moms. I texted my mom this morning. I'll talk to her later. She's in Charlotte. I don't get to see her today, but uh, love my mom. Listen, moms, never underestimate the power of your influence in another person's life and in the world. It's been said, maybe the greatest thing that you will do in your life, and moms, women do some great things. But I think often it is the case for moms. The greatest thing or accomplishment in your life may not be something you do. It may be someone you raise. And God has given us all this stewardship, those of us who are parents. But I want to say this to to all of our moms. Don't believe all the identity heresies that are coming at you constantly, all day long. And especially in our day, where we see that, you know, you've got to be this perfect mom. Listen, let's just mask and fat. There are no perfect moms. There are no super moms. There's no insta famous, look at me, sip my wine while my kids adore me moms. There's none of that. There are no perfect moms. There are only moms who are in the daily grind every single day in the midst of, of mounds of laundry, perhaps, balancing work, balancing marriage, all of the things that are your life. There are those moms who stay at it, faithful presence where no one sees them, raising children, dads doing the same along the way. But listen, mom, here's what's true about you. You are the primary storyline in your life is not that you're a mom or not a mom, a dad or not a dad. What, how, for every single one of us who are in Christ, the primary storyline in your life is that you are fully loved, totally accepted, completely forgiven. You are a daughter of the king. That is who you are. Now live out of that, right, in everything that you do. I remember when Stacy and I uh, first um, had children, kind of knew we were pregnant, and then uh, you know that we had uh, twin girls first. We had then a son, Travis, who, by the way, last weekend... Uh, Gave a ring to his girlfriend. He's now engaged to Kate Sutton, and they're getting married. So, yeah, just a little personal note. We're real excited. We've been celebrating this weekend as well. But, uh, but we had twin girls first. Now, I was going into this. I didn't know what to expect, right? I grew up with all boys. I ended up with two girls. And I was like, I, but, you know, I don't know, like, even one baby, right, would be challenging. We got two. But, hey, instant family, let's go. And so we, we jumped right in. I see Michaela right down here. Um, I was just thinking while, uh, who's pregnant? Uh, and uh, praise God, little baby hearing, hearing you worship the Lord this morning. It's just amazing. Some of you who are pregnant even now, maybe this is going to be your first uh, Mother's Day. I remember the, the first time that we, you know, had, had the girls. And the first six weeks were like a blur, I mean, Stacy is amazing. She's been an incredible wife, but for me, I didn't know what to expect. I was like, what? why is she crying? I don't know what's happening. What, how can I? What do we do here? Uh, what is jaundice? Anyway, I don't even know what. Uh-oh, a fever. What, are, uh, what do we do about this? And, and what is in this diaper? Okay, so I, I didn't know what to expect. And so you just kind of learn as you go, right? You ever felt that way in your life? Maybe at work, maybe it's in a new relationship. You go into it and don't really know what to expect. And how could you until you're in the midst of it, right? Maybe you feel that way in your Christian life, uh, that you said yes to Jesus with all that you knew, and yet it's not been real clear, perhaps, what is expected of me as a disciple. Or maybe you're not asking that question nearly enough. We're going to answer that question today. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 6. We're going to be in the book of Acts. We're walking through the book of Acts. That's, that's the storyline here, right? This is the movement that has begun that we call the church. And uh, these are our people. This is our tribe. This is who we are. Because oftentimes, like new parents, I think, like a new mom, we don't know what's expected of us. And in this text, we'll see three roles that are expected of every disciple. Every disciple is a member. Every disciple is a minister. Every disciple is a missionary. Look at chapter 6. We're going to begin with verse 1. And it says, uh, verse 1, it says this. Now, in these days, okay, so these days are what's happening uh, through really Acts 6 through 5, all that's taking place. And what is happening in these days is that the church, the gospel is, is, is advancing. The church is flourishing. The church is growing. Still small, but it's growing and uh, starting to spread as we see, and we'll see uh, as we move forward into the book of Acts, as, as Acts 1-8 becomes the outline for the book of Acts. You know that, right? Jer- Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. 
by the, by the end of it all. And that's where we are even today as we serve our friends in places like India, places like Africa, all around the world. We are taking the gospel to the whole wide world. In these days, the gospel was being proclaimed and the church then was being persecuted. Advancing the gospel, increasing persecution almost always go together, hand in hand. It happens in your personal life too, by the way, in your workplace. In school, wherever you go, the more you look like Jesus, the more people come against you. And then it says here, when the disciples were increasing in number, this first time they're called disciples, Um, certainly not in the Gospels, that's what Jesus said, you're going to be my apprentice, you're going to be my follower. But here, first time in the book of Acts, we see that they're called disciples. We're increasing in number. And uh, a complaint by the, the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews Because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So we've got problems in the church right away. Now, the Hellenistic uh, Jews or believers, they were were Greek-speaking Jews. Now, they might speak, probably did speak as a second language. They would speak uh, Hebrew or Aramaic. But they were, this was, this was now, watch this, don't miss this, a cross-cultural, cross-generational, multi-ethnic movement. Is what the church was. A watching world is seeing a group of people who aren't supposed to come together, together, united in Christ, worshiping him, and serving the world, proclaiming the gospel. But there's a problem. Note that the danger is not going to come from the outside. It's not going to be persecution from the outside. It's going to be division inside that's going to take the church down, uh, or, or at least potentially. And so what do they do? This is the story of what's going to happen. This multicultural group of believers has come together, and and now we see potential cracks in the body, okay? Uh, Potential illnesses within the body, in the family. When it it comes to things like, watch this, uh, equality, privilege, and the serving of people who are in need. Not, Not a new problem. And here, look at what happens. The Hellenistic Jews then, Hellenist Jews, They are from, again, all over the diaspora. They're all spread out, and they've been coming, serving in the, or worshiping in Greek-speaking synagogues. And now the church is rising up. They come to Christ. And you can imagine with various opinions, right, various preferences among the the members, uh, because evidently church people had preferences back then. Um, And there's this, that was a joke, and natural uh, factions within the church, we start to see these things rise up. So addressing the needs, a big deal. Not only because the widows are not being, needs are not being met, but even more so, the gospel will be thwarted and not proclaimed if this particular issue is not resolved. Look at verse 2. And the 12 summoned, so the apostles, summoned the full number of the disciples. Watch this. Catch that. Full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. I want you to notice the full number. The whole church came together to seek resolution, and as if you know this story, and to seek solution. So the whole church came together, and the apostles called out to lead, said, here's what we're going to do. We got got a problem here. So so they say, hey, uh, we've got to to keep preaching the word. We've got to keep proclaiming the gospel. And it sounds like at first, when you uh, first reading, it's like, well, these guys thought they were above, like, serving Widows, what's the deal? Like they think they're too, you know. No, no, no. They had a clear calling and a role, as we'll see today. And then they say, hey, we, we, we need help. We need help. Some have noted this, these are like the precursors of the deacons. But really, and I think it is that in, 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 in a way, but really there's just a need within the body. So let's call out certain people to address the need. And it says from the full number. The first thing I want you to see here is that every disciple, if you are a disciple, every disciple is a member a member of the body of Christ. Notice that it's the full number. It's from within the church. You know, there's, there's really the universal church that is every person on the planet, every person who's ever lived, who's come to Christ are a part of the universal church. You're a part of the family of God once you receive Christ. Okay? Not everybody might be a member of a local church, but watch this. People who are members of a local church may not be members of a universal church. If you don't know Jesus, if you've never committed your life to him, you just go to church. You're not a part of the universal, eternal church, the true church. But where is the universal church, right? It's out there. It's us. We're a part of it. It's our friends in India and Africa and South America and Cuba and all over, all around. That's the universal church. But, but, but you see, the local church, right, is the visible, 
body. Note that it's called the body of Christ. And so every member is to be, or every disciple to be an active member of a local church. I'm speaking to some of you right now. You've not yet joined the fellowship of the church. And you just keep on coming, right? Keep on coming. That's a good thing. I'm challenging you today to join the church. Today. To commit your life to being a part of the church. And I'm calling us all back today to come back to church. It's time. It's time to come back. And I get it. Some of us might be waiting on the mask to be, you know, we're hopeful these are going to be gone soon. But it is time to come back and it's time to commit yourself anew to the local church. And some of you have been waiting and today's your day. Because every disciple is in a covenant agreement with the Lord Jesus Christ to be a part of his body, the church. And so we enter into the local visible body. You can't be a part of the body if you're not connected to the body. And if you just come and watch, you're just, in, you're, just, you're just watching a show, you're in the audience, you're not a part of the body. So there's a commitment. In fact, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, he says, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body, right? So it is with the body of Christ. So notice that the problem with the widows was everybody's problem. And so the church comes together in order to solve the problem. Here's the point. When one part of the body right, hurts, your whole body is like, ouch, that hurts. My little pinky is hurting. The whole body says something's not right. In fact, Paul says it this way. I love it what he says in, in the message. In 1 Corinthians 12, 26, it reads this way. The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part dependent of every other part, the parts that are mentioned, the parts that are, that are not, the parts that we see, the parts that we don't. If one part hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into the exuberance. See, everyone is expected to be a participating member of the local church. So the full number came together, right? So every disciple is a member of a local body of believers. And next I want you to see every, we're already leaning this way, every disciple is a minister. Every person is gifted to serve the Lord. Look at verse, uh, look at verse 3. It says, therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute. Okay, good reputation. Watch this. There's some stipulations here. Full of the Spirit, wisdom, whom you, we will appoint. Okay, the leaders will appoint to this duty. So there are certain stipulations, but watch this. The first one was that they were among you. They didn't outsource the problem. They didn't say, this is, we're going to pay somebody to take care of this for us because we're here because we want to be served. No, no, no. Every one of them are stepping in to serve. In essence, they're saying, we got this. We don't go outside of ourselves. We got this. The early church addresses the problem straight on. Watch this. Pulls everybody together to say, let's resolve this. And then from among them, the solution is found, not from the outside. We have a need in our church right now that is very similar to this. Among the most vulnerable among us. And if I can be as bold as the apostles, let's go, church. Let's come together. I'm going to speak to everybody across our campus today. Our children need people who will, who will volunteer to serve, to step in as servants week after week. We have an incredible children's space that is opening up. We're, we're opening up our, our, our kids' spaces and kids' worship. We need People, parents, and others. We need some who aren't parents. We need single adults. We need all of us to say, there's a problem. Let's step in and do something about it from among us. We're not going to outsource this. And so some of you, uh, here's, I'm going to be bold, love connect groups. Some of you need to be in a connect group until Jesus comes. Others of you need to stop sitting in a connect group because you have relationships. You have Christian godly relationships, maybe out of that connect group, that you will continue to have friendships with. And you need to serve. You need to stop just sitting there listening to somebody speak every week. And you need to be out serving, discipling our children on Sunday mornings. And I'm letting the Spirit speak. This is, let the Spirit call you out. And some of y'all might be, okay, good. I don't, I don't hear the Spirit. I think I'm good. 
I think I'm good. The Spirit's not calling me out. How do you know? He's calling you to serve. He's calling every one of you. I want you to pray about this. I want you to seek the Lord in this. And it's real simple. You can go to this uh, spot on our website here. It's, it's slash serve at church. You can see it there, serve at church. It's a great page where you can just see needs. You can, you can you know, hey, reach out to me. We'd love to talk to you, okay? Whether it's Marty or Lisa Chamness or Jay or TJ or among among any of us. See, we need people who are ready to come back to church, welcome people back. We need door holders, greeters. Everybody has a place to serve, every single one of us. I always say this at our Discover Park Cities class, which, by the way, is coming March 23rd. I'm doing all I can to get you connected here, all right? Those of you who are not yet members or want to learn more about who we are as a church, um, come join us, okay? Reach out to us. Uh, we would love to serve you in some way, but come and join us. Stacy and I will be there for lunch to meet you after uh, some teaching there, some guidance on that morning. But join us on, on May 23rd. Um, and, and what we're going to do is tell you about how you can get involved in our church, what it means to be a member, talk about our values, our mission, and all those good things. I always say this to the group that's gathered. I'll say this that are not yet members. Something in our church is not yet being done because you're not yet here. You're not yet a member. And for all of us who are members, every disciple is a member of a local church, participating member, in our case, baptized believers who've joined the church who are now serving as ministers. Again, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 18, but our bodies have many parts and God has put each part just where he wants it. And often this is not rocket science. It's often trial and error. You know what it is? It starts with yes. Yes, I will serve. I'm looking at a family, a couple that I know right here. I'm not going to call them out, but when there's a need, they go, yes, we're ready. We're ready to serve. I had a friend of mine who was a deacon in a former church. He said, Jeff, when the pastor says for me to do something, when you, when you ask, I thought this was kind of weighty, but he said, you ask me to do something, my answer is always yes. It's always yes. I'm ready to serve. Do you have that kind of attitude? Because all of us are ministers, and we're all here to serve Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 11. It says, all these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. God has given you gifts to use, be used in the body. I had a pastor friend of mine. He said he had a guy in his church. He didn't know what part of the body he was. Uh, he said, I don't know if he's an appendix. Like everybody's wondering, what is he doing here? He's doing nothing, but he might blow up any moment and like damage all of us. We don't know why he's here. And, and, and let, me, let me ask you, what is your part in the body? Here's the key question for the day, for every one of us. What's your ministry? Everyone should be able to answer that one right away. And if you can't, let us help you. Because it's in the doing that you, you receive such great joy in serving. That's how we've been created. And so I'm calling us to, to action today, every single one of us. What is your ministry? So look at verse 4, back to the story. But we will, these are the apostles, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Okay, so some are called to be, uh, to be preacher, teacher types like myself. We have a role to play in the body. Everybody has a role. My role is described here. I've said it for years. Acts 6, 4, my primary role is prayer and ministry of the word. And when you think about it, you know, oftentimes it's, well, I wish the pastor, how come Jeff didn't come? He didn't do my wedding or he didn't do my funeral. Why didn't he come? Why isn't he at this event? Does he not care about my ministry, this thing I'm about? Listen, wouldn't, at the end of the day, wouldn't you want your pastor to be fully devoted to prayer and to the ministry of the word above all else? If I am focused on that, if our preaching team is focused on that, everybody wins and the gospel advances. That's what happens here. The church has suffered for way too long because of a clergy laity distinction. See, this is the other side of it. We're all ministers, and it's where some of us have thought, yeah, but there's the called out people, you know, like the apostles. Like there's Jeff who does all this, and he preaches the word, and that's not my role. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a lay person. You know what laity means, by the way? Ignorant is what it means, literally. And so you're not ignorant. 
Every one of us have been called to serve. We're all ministers of the gospel. Every member is a minister. There's a lot of reasons throughout history, I've studied this, why this is the case. How did we get to this laity clergy distinction, such a polarized distinction, where there are those who are called out to serve and then the rest of us? How did we get there? Well, one example, there's a lot of reasons, but one example is found in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. I want you to see this. Geek out with me for just a minute as we look at this because in the King James Version, we got a misplaced comma that changes the entire text. See, there's no pronunciation. There's no commas. There's, no, there's none of that in the Greek. So the translators take this. And King James, okay, um, during a time when this was kind of the, you know, the way that the church went, Watch what happens. And he gave some, this would be Jesus, gave some to the apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. So that last one is kind of a hyphenated pastor, teachers. That's, that's my role, shepherd, teacher. And then it says, watch this. He's called some out, okay, to lead, for the perfecting of the saints, comma, there it is, for the work of the ministry, comma, for the edifying of the building up the body of Christ. Till we all reach the unity of maturity together in him is where it goes. But you see what it says there? There are those who are called out to be all these different things, to do all of it. Is this to but to do the work of ministry. But watch this. What we have in the ESV is properly pronunciated. Look, look at look at verse 11 of the ESV. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, okay, those called out to lead, to equip the saints, no comma. To equip the saints for the work of ministry. Not to equip the saints, do the work of ministry, wear themselves out until they die, and everybody applauds that they worked so hard. It doesn't say that. It says every person is a part of the solution and every person has a gift. We talk about this all the time on our staff team. We talked about it this week. We're here to equip the saints to do the work of ministry right alongside you because we all have gifts that come to bear, all right? So often we think uh, ministry, being a minister is synonymous with kind of vocational ministry. We're all equipped. We're all here to serve. And the Lord has called it. We are in, here's why I'm so passionate about this today. We're in a pivotal moment in church history. And it's time for every member, every person to join the fellowship of a local church and every member to step up and serve and be a minister. Because gang, we are at a, we're at a place really to pivot Each one of us, and in your personal life, I'm challenging you to do so. Again, Bible studies are amazing. Some of you are in like three Bible studies. That's good. You're sitting there learning all about it. But you need to get busy and serve the Lord. What's your ministry? Everyone should be able to answer that question. So look at verse 5. Here's what happens. Here's how this plays out. After the resolution is brought to the whole church, everybody's got a role in this. And then in verse five, it says what they said, please the whole con- you know, gathering, everybody. It's like, this is a good idea. And then it names these people. I love this. I love, these are individuals. These are our people, right? It names all of them. And among them, Stephen and Philip, who are named first because they're raised up. They're, they're equipped to, to become leaders. And it names every single one of them. Then in verse six, it says, and these, they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid hands over them to serve tables. Listen, the greatest servants among us are those who right now are caring for our children. Some are changing diapers to the glory of God right now and in the next hour. And you can do the same. Some are behind cameras right now. Some are in our production room. Some are out getting ready for us to join them on the lawn. Some will be singing. Some are in the orchestra. Some are teaching connect groups. Some, we need more and more. Some are teaching our little children today about how much God loves them. You can be a part of discipling the next generation. The greatest of heroes among us are a lot like moms. And I praise God for those who are serving every single Sunday, you need to be one of them. Look at verse 7. And the, here's the result. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Every disciple is a member of the church, an active participating member. Every disciple has a ministry. Every disciple is ready to step up. And what happens is, The gospel advances, and even the enemies of the church come to faith in Jesus when everybody does their part. 
Every disciple is a member. Every disciple is a minister. And finally, as I close, every disciple is a missionary. That's what's happening. And when you decide that you are a missionary, it changes how you approach all of life. When you go into work as a missionary, you assess the needs. What are the dreams of the people? What are the needs among these people? How about this person? What we've talked about is we said when you go out to be a, be a missionary, you're going to bless others, right? The year of blessing here at our church. We said we begin with prayer. We listen well. It's simple. We eat with them. We have coffee with them. We get to know what their needs are. And out of that, we know then how to serve them. And then out of serving, we share our story with them of how Christ has changed our lives. And in the midst of that is the gospel story of how he died on the cross for our sins. He was raised again so that we could have new life. And we don't have to live for ourselves anymore. And many of you are here today. I want my life to count for something. It's time to decide that your church experience will never be the same again because you know that God has called you out. You see, the whole church is on mission for Jesus. There, there's not like a missions department. The entire church and every person is a missionary. In fact, it was Charles Spurgeon who offered famously, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. And then he goes on to say, recollect that. He says, remember that. You're either, he says, you either try to spread the, the kingdom abroad, the kingdom of God abroad, or else you do not love him at all. Whoo! You say, that's kind of bold. I love Jesus. How are you serving him? How are you using your gifts that he has given you to serve others? So when I became a dad... When our twin daughters were born, I didn't know what to expect. Jesus has been very clear. Die to yourself. Follow me. And I will bless you with the greatest life that you could ever have. Let's pray together as we close our time. Lord, we thank you for your calling on our lives today. I thank you for this convicting passage that each of us would find our place of service and that we'd respond. Lord, I pray that you would do what I cannot do. I can preach the word. I can seek your face. I can call on you to move as we all have today. But Lord, would you in each person cause us to really come to grips with what our role is in the body of Christ. I pray for every person who is not a member that today they would join. They would take steps today. I pray for every person who can't answer the question quickly, what is your ministry I pray that we would wrestle with that and be able to answer it before the day is done. And we'll move towards serving. I pray for the needs that we have in our church right now. I pray for the financial uh, needs that we have towards our new, the renovation of our new kids' space. I pray, Lord, that you will bless us, that we would be the church as we respond to what you have done for us. You died on the cross so that we could be saved. And friend, if you're watching me here online or you, you're hearing my voice and you've never accepted Christ, today's your day to say yes to him. Just say yes. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Thank you that you lived the perfect life because I couldn't. You died a death that I could not so that I might live forever. I receive your grace right now. And I give you my life. Lord, may we be the church that you envisioned us to be. May we reach our fullest redemptive potential as every one of us take on the role you've called us to in the body of Christ. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.